Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by CIBC. Good evening and bienvenidos to Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices. I'm Hugo Balta, WTTW News Director and your host. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Now on the show tonight, it's not just their health that is at risk. We talk with journalists about the devastating financial impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in Latino communities, including the hospitality industry, a sector that employs many Latino women. Two of them share their concerns with us about getting their jo old jobs back. Environmental impacts and in inequitable distribution. A look at why some Chicagoans are fighting large distribution centers. And this Black History Month, we look to the queen and of salsa to give us a little azúcar. First off tonight, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, the Latino community has been at a heightened risk of infection and death. But the coronavirus has not only endangered the health of Latinos, it's also harming their finances and making them more likely to lose their homes. This week, as part of Chicago Tonight's In Your Neighborhood series, we spoke with Dan Fulweiler, CEO of Esperanza Health Centers in Gage Park. He shared insights about how the pandemic has brought many Latino communities to the brink. Almost 20% of our patients as a whole have had COVID by now, um, and it's been very difficult on, on every level. Um, we receive requests from people all the time for things that might surprise you. Um, we had a patient a couple weeks ago come to our patient emergency fund because they needed $200 to pay for a cremation. Um, those kind of things are heart-wrenching, and it's really hard to see how, how the pandemic has affected us. Joining us now with more are Charmaine Runes, a reporter with Southside Weekly, Justin Agrello, a reporter with City Bureau, and Maria Inés Samudio, a reporter with WBEZ Chicago. Maria Inés, last fall you reported that 87% of Latino households disclosed having serious financial problems due to the pandemic. What is the picture like now for those families? Look, the situation for Latinos is bad. During the pandemic, workers have been either laid off or their hours have been reduced. And the reality is that the industries where a lot of Latinos are concentrated are the ones that have also lost a lot of jobs. For example, we've lost over 8 million jobs in the hospitality industry alone. And when we look at the industries that are still doing really well, that haven't seen a lot of layoffs, we also see that those industries just don't employ a lot of Latinos. So as a result, you're seeing a lot of families struggling financially. Um, a, a poll that I reported on last September showed that about 72% of Latino households in Chicago reported having, having serious financial problems compared to 36% of, of white households in the city. So, so that kind of shows you the situation that Latinos are living in right now. And the, the worst part about it is that for Latinos who don't have proper documentations or uh, they live in mixed status families, they often don't receive the stimulus money that other Americans have received. So that puts people in a really vulnerable situation. And what you end up seeing a lot is in communities where one member of the family has lost a job, they often go to work in warehousing. They get a, a job in temp agencies, they go and work, and those same warehouses have a lot of COVID cases. So then they bring their, you know, they bring the virus to, to their home, to their multi-general multi-generational household. And that's why you see that Latinos still have the highest infection rates in Chicago. Justin, you've reported that despite the moratorium on evictions, people are still getting evicted. What are some of the stories you're hearing? Yeah, um, we're hearing a lot of different stories. I think people don't realize that eviction court is still open, that landlords can file evictions against tenants who supposedly pose a threat. Um, and, you know, landlords never really needed the court system to displace black and brown people. Um, and we're definitely still hearing that now. People, um, yeah, landlords are using illegal lockouts, shutting off utilities, um, threats of violence, et cetera, to, to really move people. And, um, yeah, that's, we're sort of hearing a lot of that. Um, we, we spoke with 30 different renters for um, a recent story that we just published called The Housing Cliff. And, and it really just highlighted how, folk, how easily folks have fallen through the cracks 
um, and how how little or like how ineffective the eviction moratorium has been um, at keeping people in place. A lot of people struggling. You, know, you mentioned it. Maria Inez painted a, a really you know broad picture about just the, the suffering that the community is going through. It's challenging to get a complete picture of who's at risk of poverty and homelessness in this crisis. Charmaine, what might be keeping us from having an accurate data? There are lots of reasons why uh, we might not have accurate data on who is at risk of you know, experiencing poverty and, and homelessness. So there are a couple of different ways that the city collects data on you know, who's at risk of losing, losing their housing. And as far as I can tell, based on my reporting, it, it's cobbled together from, from different sources. There's the homeless management information system, which you know, keeps track of folks who are in touch with services, but there are many people who, um, for whatever reason, are not in shelters and are not on the streets and haven't, you know, experienced outreach by the city or by nonprofits. You know, they're just not in the system, and and there is no way for the city to really know just how many people are, you know, experiencing experiencing this loss in not only income but of, of housing, of having a roof over their heads as well. I mean, as you mentioned, industries that employ a lot of undocumented immigrants have slowed work or closed in the pandemic. What impact might President Biden's immigration policy have on the ability of undocumented immigrants to return to work? It's going to take a while. It's going to take a really long time. The, the Biden administration has a lot of work to do to sort of undo some of the harm caused by the Trump administration. And that change will come very, very slowly. And it's going to face a lot of opposition. For example, he issued a moratorium to um, to stop deportations in the first 100 days of his administration. Um, <clears throat> but that was challenged in court. And so a federal judge in Texas actually issued a temporary stay of that order. Um, and we also see that he's got a lot of work to do in reuniting families, right? Um, the Trump administration separated thousands of families. And a lot of children are still separated from their parents. And, you know, the, the, the Trump administration has been reported widely, kept very poor records. And so that's going to take up a lot of time and energy. He's also having to face the fact that there are thousands of asylum seekers at the border living in squalor, asking to come into the country and ask for political asylum. Let me go back uh, uh, again to homelessness. It, it seems to me that, that this is the case. But Charmaine, have we seen an uptick in homelessness since the, since the pandemic began? What are the challenges uh, to collecting data on the homelessness? Yeah, so it is, it is hard to say, but it does seem incredibly likely that we've seen an uptick in homelessness. Um, just based on the number of evictions and people not being able to make rent and not being sure where to go. I think the, the trouble with really documenting um, homelessness and whether that has increased or not is because the, the shelter system has experienced so much chaos because of COVID, right? Like the, the number of beds that you can fit in one space is no longer the same because of the need to social distance. And so... I think that, you know, we likely have seen an uptick. In fact, in um, 2020, during the point in time count, which is an annual count that the Department of Family and Support Services conducts every year to sort of get a snapshot of who is experiencing homelessness at, you know, on a single night in January, we actually saw a 2% increase from 2019. And that was at the very beginning of the year. That was before COVID had really hit the city. Um, you know, and a lot of that increase came from folks who were staying on the street as opposed to being in the shelter. That was a 21% increase of folks staying in shelters. And again, this is before COVID hit. And so, sure. you know, and, and very, very difficult situation. I, I want to get in one last question to Justin. Is the anticipated COVID, uh, COVID relief package coming fast enough or, or enough to help? Um, I guess it depends on who you ask. I think families that have been out of work for almost a year, they would say no, right? Like um, people have been struggling for a long time and the city did supply two rounds of, um, or three rounds of rental assistance last year, but the need far um, exceeded the city's supply of it. So I think it, it really depends on who you're asking um, and what their, their situation has been over, the, over this almost a year. A lot of challenges and opportunities ahead. We'll have to leave it at that for now and hope to have you soon back on the show. Our thanks to all of you for your time and insights. Thank you.
Thank you. Up next, a look at the impact the pandemic is having on hospitality workers in a conversation from earlier this week. coronavirus pandemic has devastated the hospitality industry, including hotels and those who work in them. Many people who have been impacted are women from black and brown communities. According to the Economic Policy Institute, before the pandemic, more than 14% of Latinas worked in the hospitality sector. And many working in housekeeping are older women who are Spanish language dominant. Maria Delgado has worked as a housekeeper in Chicago for 16 years until she was let go in October. She shared with us what her job meant to her. Bueno, para mí significaba demasiado mucho porque de mi trabajo yo dependo de todo, tú me entiendes? Este, dependo para ayudar a mi familia, para pagar mis biles, este, para pagar mi mortgage que debo mi casa, eh, para tantas cosas que ya no puedo hacer desde que me despidieron de mi trabajo. Again, that was Maria Delgado, who's worked as a housekeeper at the Marriott Magnificent Mile until she was let go this past October. And joining us now to share their experiences are Melissa Magaña. She was a housekeeper at a Hyatt-centric The Loop Chicago for four years. And Teresa Hernandez, she was a banquet server at Swiss Hotel Chicago, where she worked for 20 years. We should note, we reached out to both hotels, but neither responded to us in time for this conversation. Let's start with you, Ter Teresa. We just heard from Maria on what her job meant to her. What about you? You've worked in the industry for 20 years. Yes, I was on the hotel for 20 years and I depend from my, from my job for everything, to pay my house, my bills, my, all oh, my utilities, everything. I'm behind in my mortgage payments already because I have al already almost a year we're not working. One of the things that Maria also mentioned to us is that while she's collecting unemployment, she has a difficult time making ends meet. Melissa, are you facing similar challenges? Yes, I was um, let go in March when the pandemic had just started. And ever since then, it's been very stressful. I'm a single mother of five. I've been struggling. I've been backed up in rent, bills. I'm actually back, really backed up in my bills right now. I have two sons in college. So everything has been very difficult since March. Another thing Maria shared with us was her age. As a barrier to finding another job, Karen Kent, the president of Unite Here Local One, which represents about half of hotel workers in Chicago, also said age is a challenge for many women. Let's listen. The odds are against women to get another job later in life or get hired as much as a man or get hired as much as somebody who's younger. They'll earn less wages. They'll salaries will decrease. They'll just have a much tougher time and slip into poverty much faster. Teresa, is that a challenge for you too? What other difficulties are you facing? Yes, especially with my age, I'm not 60 years old. I mean, it's not easy for me to go and apply in another place. And besides that, the, uh, I'm trying to apply in a factory and they got already their own people. They're not gonna hire me because my age. Very tough situation. Melissa, what are you hearing from your colleagues? Are they in similar situations? Yes. Um, um, a lot of people are going through the same uh, thing. That's why we're fighting to, for this ordinance because I'm not only speaking for myself, I speak for everybody out everybody. there. I, I've been wor I was working at the hotel for four years, but people have been there 15, 20 years, and I feel like they just used us when they needed us, and now they let us go. Now, there's a pending ordinance in city council that would require hotels to offer former employees the right to return to their old jobs before they could hire outside replacements. We should note 
that Illinois Hotels and Lodging Association says the ordinance would be difficult to implement, requiring hotels to jump through more regulatory and paperwork hoops. Teresa, are you afraid that when your hotel does begin hiring, that there won't be a spot for you? Yes, I'm, I'm very afraid. I'm, I'm, I'm so nervous. Um, sometimes I don't sleep. I'm thinking they, they probably they're not going to call me because my age and me, it, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult because too many years I was there and they just throw me out. It's hard. It's very so hard. I'm sorry to hear that. Melissa, would, would the ordinance ease some of your concerns, some of your fears? Oh, yes, definitely. I'm not very young anymore either. It's difficult. I've applied to jobs and it's not easy out there. I don't think it's fair that we have to struggle, uh, be stressed out looking for a job when we already have one. We lost it because of a pandemic, not because of our fault. Melissa, Teresa, we wish you the best of luck during these challenging times, and thank you so much for joining us and sharing your experiences with us. Thank you. And we're back with more Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, but first to Brandis Friedman with a look at what's on tap for tomorrow. Ugo, we've got a great show planned tomorrow. A conversation on how black history is being taught in schools, plus life after prison in this week's Black Voices Book Club selection, a rediscovered interview from WTTW's Our People and teaching young men to be gentlemen. Tomorrow at 6 on Chicago Tonight, Black Voices. Now, Ugo, back to you. Thanks, Brandis. City officials held a community meeting late last month, giving updates on the response to the faulty demolition of the former Crawford coal plant and on the status of the project replacing it, a large distribution center scheduled to be completed this spring. Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg has been looking into those centers and joins us now. Welcome to the show, Nick. Thanks, Hugo. So these so-called last mile distribution centers, they're used by companies like Amazon and Target to fulfill their online orders. And they've been growing fast in recent years, but critics are increasingly sounding an alarm about the impact of these centers and the fact that many of them are located in lower income neighborhoods and communities of color. A plot of land in Bridgeport between the river and I-55 is the latest site set to become a last mile distribution center built by the developer Prologis. What we've heard uh, via some of the news outlets is that it would be leased to Amazon. It's on track to join dozens of Amazon distribution centers built in the Chicago area in recent years and was approved at a November meeting of the city's plan commission. Distribution facilities, including the one proposed to be constructed here, serve a critical function in the local, regional, and national global supply chain. Some neighbors are opposed because of the additional truck traffic and because of how the deal came together. The developer met with the aldermen and city officials in summer 2019. The first public meeting wasn't for another year. The community was not involved in the process. We were not told this was coming in or asked if we wanted it or what sort of mitigations we would want if it was coming in. The local alderman has a different take and uh, I think this will be a good development project for the city of Chicago and specifically for the 11th Ward and Bridgeport community. Now, we're not all going to agree, uh, but I do think that we've uh, listened to the community. We've made modifications and changes. Changes include infrastructure improvements, landscaping on the side of the lot adjacent to homes, and a public river walk. And the developer says the goal is for all the vehicles on the site to be electric. But it's not just air pollution issues. Neighbors are also concerned about more truck traffic on this already busy stretch of Halstead, putting more semis potentially in conflict with cyclists using the Halstead bike lane and pedestrians coming to and from the nearby CTA station. I myself was hit at this intersection at Halstead and uh, Archer in 2016. Uh, I went through about 10 months of surgeries and physical therapy, uh, and uh, I don't want anyone else to have to go through that. Transportation equity advocate Linda Lopez says that's a widespread concern about distribution centers. She sees contradictions in city policies. We want a city that where people can enjoy existing without a car, but we're also bringing in so much more truck traffic with a lot of these distribution sites. While Lopez says better infrastructure and electric fleets can make distribution safer and greener. Well, why do we need to be ordering everything online and expect like one day delivery? Why can't you wait three days? Or is there something locally in your in your community where you can go to? 
Supporters say distribution centers can create jobs in places that have long faced disinvestment and unemployment. The launch of this new Amazon delivery station right here in Pullman uh, to help them expand, hire more workers, and serve more customers. All of which helps our residents work in their own neighborhood. So when they get home to their kids faster, and they can be there when they wake up. But critics say they aren't always good jobs. Amazon's been criticized for poor working conditions. Labor organizers say many positions are low wage and only part time. We should be pursuing developments that will attract quality employment um, and that will build wealth in our communities. The Little Village Environmental Justice Organization has for years fought a distribution center planned for the former Crawford coal plant, where a botched demolition blanketed the neighborhood in dust. We're not going to give up until the ribbon is cut, and even then we're still going to put pressure on the city and, and, and our lo local elected officials to actually do something about this larger issue of the concentration of these facilities in, in communities of color. Which city officials have acknowledged, as well as the fact that many fall in areas with poor air quality, according to the city's own index. Chicago's Planning and Development Commissioner says future sites won't all be on the south and west sides because companies want to be close to consumers around the city. But he says distribution is growing fast. We as Chicagoans have to accept that this sector is a part of Chicago's uh, future economy. Our job as stewards of the public interest is to get the best public benefit uh, out of these facilities and hold them to a high standard uh, of uh, livability. In the meantime, opponents of the Bridgeport Distribution Center hope to push back on its building permits and meet with the developer on safety issues. And Acosta Cordova, who's been fighting the Little Village site, says he hopes leaders think bigger. Uh, you know, I think Chicago as a, as a major city, not only nationally but globally, can also be a, a, a model for how other cities transition away from fossil fuels. The question is, will our, our political and, and, and economic leaders um, allow us to do that? The Chicago Environmental Justice Network and the Transportation Equity Network are set to hold a town hall on warehouses, trucking, distribution, and logistics on the south side later this month. Several city departments are also planning to launch a study of southwest side industrial areas early this year. Now, Nick, uh, there's been some news this week about one of Amazon's Chicago warehouses. What can you tell us about that? That's right, Hugo. Workers at Amazon's DCH1 distribution center at 28th and Western say they're being forced into 10 and a half hour overnight shifts that the company reportedly calls mega cycles. So where you're working from 1.20 a.m. until 11.50 a.m. Now they're demanding that Amazon offer accommodations for folks who can only work part of the shift. Uh, they want increased wages for overnight work and lift rides to and from work, which they say Amazon provides its associates in New York. And employees also say Amazon's planning to shut down that DCH1 facility. So Bridgeport activists fear those jobs are going to be shifted to the facility we just told you about, uh, which they say isn't creating any new jobs, just moving them around the city. Mega cycles. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. The Afro-Cuban vocalist Celia Cruz, the queen of salsa, was known for her dazzling smile, vibrant stage costumes, and mastery of a wide variety of Afro-Cuban musical styles. In this throwback from a 2002 episode of Artbeat, Cruz performs her signature hit, Quimbara, a word that is not Spanish, but African in origin, at the Chicago Theater.
Again, that was, all, that was Celia Cruz, also known as the Queen of Salsa, singing her signature hit, Quimbada. And that's our show for this Saturday night. Be sure to check out our website, wgtw.com news for more from WGTW News, including the latest on when Chicago Public School students will return for in-person learning. And of course, join Brandis Friedman tomorrow night for Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, I'm Hugo Balta. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay informed, stay healthy, stay safe. Muy buenas noches. made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm, sponsoring a free continuing legal education program for over a decade for lawyers across the state.